just see me. Ellen, I love her to death. She's a, she's a good character. If you don't get a chance to talk to Ellen much, she's a lot of fun. Notice verse 1 says, Simon Peter. Simon uses his surname there. Of course, he also uses the name that Christ gave him as well. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. Not only in a doulos, a, a servant, a bond slave, if you will, but also one sent and sent with authority. To them that have obtained like precious faith, that'd be me and you as well, through uh, the righteousness of God, with us through the righteousness of God. And one of the reasons that I wanted you to see that righteousness, notice that right there, through the righteousness of God. Of God, Because we'll find over in the book of Romans, in Romans chapter 1, most of us are probably really familiar with Romans chapter 1, but I want to draw your attention particularly down to verses 16 and 17. Paul will say there in that introduction, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. But I want you to notice verse 17. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed. That's not talking about the fact that God is righteous. We know that. That's talking about how we become in relationship with God. How we become righteousness. The righteousness that God would have us to have is through the gospel. And that's exactly what's being spoken of here in uh, 1 Peter chapter, or 2 Peter chapter 1. Through the righteousness of God. That's the plan of salvation, friends. That's the gospel. That's not God's being righteous. That's us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Same thing that Paul is saying there in Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. Notice he goes on and says, Grace and peace be multiplied uh, to you through the knowledge of God and of our Lord, uh, Je and our Jesus, and of Jesus our Lord according as his divine power. If you don't believe in underlining things, or, or if you do believe in underlining things, this is one of those verses that you ought to have highlighted. I would have verse 1 through the righteousness. I'd make a little footnote out to the side, Romans 1, 16 and 17. I would also have verse 3 underlined because it is one of the great powerful passages talking about the inspiration of the Bible and the fact that the Bible is all that we need to become godly. To, have, to do exactly what God would have us to do. We don't need writings from other men. Notice, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things. How many things is that? Everything. All things that pertain unto life and to godliness. You want to live life righteously? You want to be godly? Then you have it right here. God has given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, that you can know the mind of God, and that you can walk in the footsteps of Jesus, that you can be a partaker of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. How have you done that? Through the gospel. And then in verse 5, we begin a series of, of, of verses that talk about the seven graces. It says, and besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. The word charity there, I've chosen to use the word love, is simply because that word has changed connotations, it's changed the way we use it over the last uh, few hundred years for sure. When you think of charity, you're probably like me, you think of of uh, somebody that's, you know, looking for uh, money to help out with people in need, things of this nature. The word there is from the Greek word agape, and it's simply love. Love, uh, and it is the capstone, if you will, of the Christian graces. So in, even when I'm just doing my reading, I always try to throw the word love in there because that just clicks quicker with me, and I understand more of what's being spoken of there. What I want to talk to, to you tonight is about or bring about a lesson it's from that old faithful gospel preacher, Marshall Keeble. He died in 1968, lived from 1878 to 1968, did a tremendous amount of work, particularly in the Nashville area. Uh, he's one of those guys that was running the Nashville uh, uh, school, and he had a lot of young men, and when he would come around and preach, 
he would bring those young men with him. Do you, uh, was anybody here the day that uh, Marshall Keeble preached here? I know Joseph Parton was. We have a couple. Well, did he bring some young men? Did they speak before he spoke? That was a very common thing that Brother Keeble would do just about anywhere he would go. And one of the reasons he, you know, he'd give them pulpit time, give them a chance to stand up and, you know, kind of get them shaking knees to try to be a little quieter as they would stand up from time to time and learn to preach the gospel. One of the very tragic things to happen to Brother Keeble was, well, he was a good man, and he believed in Christians, and he, and he had confidence in brethren, and there was a shyster that was running around Nashville who was a member of the church who took $100,000 from the school. Now, I'm talking back, back in the day and age when $100,000 was a real chunk of change. Of course, that's really a chunk of change to me. I probably don't have half that in my wallet right now. So, but... But sir, that was a lot of money. He died in 1968. So this man told him, says, listen, why don't you take that money that you have in there running? I think it was at about 6% interest. He said, why don't you take that money out and give it to me? I'll invest it for you, and I can promise you a return somewhere around 12 to 15%. Well, just good stewardship, Brother Keeble felt like that, would, that should be the thing. This man was well known in Nashville as a longtime member of the church, and so he did just that. And that's about when the wheels came off for that fella. And not only did he lose the school's money, Brother Keeble's investment and so forth, but a lot of members of the church were hurt by this individual uh, in Nashville. I don't remember his name, or I'd be happy to tell you. But Brother Keeble was a longtime faithful uh, gospel preacher. He had a sermon. It was called Five Steps into the Church and Seven Steps into Heaven. I could not find a picture of it. I know that I own it. I know that somewhere in that mess back there that I call files in a library, that I have it, but I could not for the life of me. I went through Brother Keeble's little short biography from uh, mule back to jet plane as a little small little uh, biography about him, but I could not find a picture of the, of the sermon, so I just thought I'd do the best I could. Five steps into the church and seven steps into heaven, how one leaves the world and is promised a home with glory, how was that crown of life that Paul says awaited for him upon his death. And notice that the two were separated by water. Just as the old world was separated water by water, this too is separated by water. The world is separated by heaven from water, and it's water that God has placed where he's placed it. Me and you have not done that. Here, of course, will be the abbreviations we will use, and most of you already know everything that I'm going to say tonight. But I believe that uh, you know if we keep preaching these first principles, and keep teaching over and over again the plan of salvation, then it just might be the case that when my children and that when your children and when our grandchildren and their great-grandchildren maybe go back and read part of this or hear part of this or can go back to their minds, they'll know what it takes for one to become a member of the Lord's church and how that one needs to live their life to be a Christian. These were the kind of lessons that we were preaching 50 years ago, and we were having a lot of success uh, in our area. I know that times have changed. I know it's hard to get your neighbors to even talk about the Bible if you ever get a chance to even see them. Times have changed with regards to that. But the simplicity of these lessons have not changed, and the honesty and just forthrightfulness of them haven't changed as well. They're unarguable. There's really no way somebody can look at this and look what the Bible says and say, well, that's wrong, because it really is about as simple as one could be. We look at the letters that are given, of course, HBRCB, hear, believe, repent, confess, to being baptized. And then on the other side, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brother kindness. And you'll notice that I have changed charity uh, to the word love simply because it's uh, much easier in our vernacular today. First of all, one must hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. That just goes without saying. It's not some kind of, you know, essence that falls down from the sky and makes you want to be a Christian. It's not some kind of oozy-goozy substance that the Holy Spirit uh, is poured out by the hand of God like some of your Pentecostals on television would like to show you. The Spirit of God is much a person as Jesus himself and God the Father. He is a he, he has personality, and as in the long ago guy in Wood said, if we will remember that the Holy Spirit is a member of the Godhead, then a lot of the modern-day error that it goes on with regards to the Holy Spirit would be erased. He is God. He is a part of the Godhead. And unless men hear the gospel, they cannot obey it. Romans chapter 10 is a lengthy 
a dissertation about how blessed are the feet of them that take the gospel. A man's got to be able to hear the gospel. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. It's not just the work of the Spirit separate and apart from words. The, I, I've even heard of people saying, I heard a fellow one time talking about how the Spirit had beat their missionary team over to another country. When they got there, there were already a whole bunch of Christians there. That's not how the Spirit of God works. That's not how God works today. God works through men, through earthen vessels. And in a day and time when miraculous things were taking place, angels didn't preach the gospel. Men weren't miraculously endowed with the gospel message to go and be saved. They had to hear from other men. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And I think one of the problems a lot of our congregations and churches today are having trouble with faith is that they're not hearing the word of God. I realize, brethren, that I use a lot of Bible. And some of you might say, yeah, you use too much. I can't keep up with it. That's why I try to use the screens. That's why when I do ask you to open your Bibles, I try to give you time to get there. Because I just don't believe that I ought to just say something and you ought to take my word for it. I believe that I ought to show you from the Bible where the things that I'm saying come from. And then let you decide for yourself if this is indeed the oracles of God or not. Too many places today the preacher spends all of his time speaking and doesn't give book, chapter, and, per and verse for what he's saying, and the people are basically left up to decide whether to believe him or not. I don't believe that's what gospel preaching is about. I don't believe that's what you find in the first century when you read the, uh, the sermons of Peter or of Paul. You find over and over again them not only preaching but using the word of God and showing it to be the case and opening and alleging that the things they spoke were so. The next step, of course, is one must believe. That's what separates the folks we were talking about this morning. Everybody has a chance to hear. But what separates people from becoming Christians is not becoming Christians. As some 3,000 obeyed the gospel on the day of Pentecost, believe me, there were many more people there than those 3,000. Many chose not to. One must believe. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. It is a part of the gospel plan of salvation. So you must hear, you must believe. And of course, the next step is repentance. Once one understands that, listen, I am not doing what God would have me to do. I am a sinner. They must come to the realization that they're a sinner and that they need to repent of those sins to change their mind, to change their lifestyle. Jesus would tell those Jews that he was talking to in verses 3 and 5 of Luke 13, I tell you nay, except you repent. You have this mind change, if you will. You shall likewise perish. The next step, of course, would be confess. To confess that indeed Jesus is Christ, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. There's a lot said in that. Curios. He's the king. Confess the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. And then of last, of course, is what we call baptism, what the Bible calls baptism. It is not a pouring, it is not a sprinkling, it is baptizo. Baptizo, baptism is simply the anglicized Greek word baptizo. And baptizo means to dip and to plunge, to immerse. It never means to pour, it never means to sprinkle. Those are entirely different Greek words. And, I told, and I've told you before what I read long ago from uh, Alexander Campbell who made a very, very thought-provoking argument that the reason that the King James translators in 1611 did not translate that word, immerse, was the very fact that the places where they were worshiping and the people that they were working for did not practice immersion. What did they practice? They practiced sprinkling. And so that would have put them in jeopardy right there. So instead of actually translating that immerse, as some of the newer translations have, they simply took the Greek letter beta and put our B, uh, alpha, and so forth from baptizo to baptism. That's why you look at it. That's not a translation. That is what we call a transliteration. A baptism is a burial. Uh, you know, uh, you look at uh, the, the, the various verses that talk about it being a burial, that one is uh, dead, he is buried, and he is raised to walk in newness of life. Romans chapter 6, for instance. Colossians chapter 2 at verse 12, no one has ever been buried in a shaker full of water nor in a pitcher. You can't pour an individual. You can't sprinkle an individual. 
but you can immerse an individual. You can baptize an individual. So baptism, baptism is the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. Brethren, I didn't write that. You didn't write that. The Holy Spirit through the uh, pen of the Apostle Paul wrote that over 2,000 years ago, but it is something that we must continue to preach and encourage people because no one who is not baptized for their sin, who does not obey the gospel, will be saved. It's that simple. Now, we're talking about, of course, people who are lost. We're not talking about people who are mentally challenged. We're not talking about infants. We're not talking about small children who've never got to the age where they even realize right from wrong. We are talking about folks who, as we talked about this morning in our adult class, have sinned. They have transgressed the law of God. They're old enough to know what that is. They are accountable. Notice 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 at verse 7. Who is going to be lost? Who is the ones that are going to be destroyed? Those that have not obeyed the gospel and know not God. And brethren, part of that gospel plan is to be baptized for the remission of our sins. Not only does that put one into the church, but it is the basis of faith. We act on that as faith. Faith is the undergirding, if you will. And that's why Peter will say, and add unto your faith. Bring your faith with you and add unto it the seven graces that we find. Now, these are not just one thing you say, okay, man, I've got virtue down. I'm going to move to the next one. It's basically a growth process. And these are all kind of come together to help us have the kind of Christian life that we should have. Faith, of course, without faith, it is an impossible to please God. And that's why we have the gospel plan of salvation. It takes faith to do those things. You must realize that that's what you need to do. Accept that to be the fact. And on faith, be baptized for the emissions of your sins, realizing that the water doesn't do anything for you. Who's taking care of you? Who's cleaning you up in baptism? Colossians chapter 2 and verse 12. Faith in the operation of God. And God says at that point, I am going to put you in contact with my son's blood, and you're going to be baptized into his death, Romans 6, 3, and 4. Without faith, impossible to please him. He that cometh to God must believe that he is and is a rewarder of them that they diligently seek him. Then we start that climb with virtue. Virtue comes from a Greek word called erete, and it simply means moral goodness. Now, you'll find virtue used several times, the English word virtue, but about half the times, it's translated from the Greek word dunamis. Remember when Jesus had his garment touched? His garment touched and he stopped and he said, who touched me? And he says, because I felt virtue leave me. Well, that's not our word arete. That's from the word dunamis. He felt power uh, leave him. And of course, remember the woman was healed. Remember she had an issue of blood. And she was scared to talk to Jesus. And so she said, boy, if I can just touch his garment. And of course, she touched his garment and instantly... She was healed, and Jesus knew, though, that dunamis, a virtue, had gone out from him. That was just power. Now, the word that Peter uses is uh, pretty much, except for one time, the Apostle Paul uses it, is a, per, is, is, a, is a word that Peter uses, and it simply means a moral goodness, a virtue, uprightness. More than an action, it is a mindset. It is a, a mindset that says, I want to try to be a virtuous person. I want to try to do what's right. I want to try to be that kind of example that I can be to my fellow Christians and to my fellow man. The next one, of course, is knowledge. If you just happen to look at 1 Peter, and this is another thing. I've gone through, I've marked every time the word knowledge appears in chapter 1 because that's what this chapter is about. If you, if you notice, you go down through there, verse 3, through knowledge of him. It's again, verse 5, verse 6, uh, verse 8, verse 12. Uh, to know, remembrance. Verse 13, remembrance, remembrance. It's a knowledge-filled chapter. Knowledge is what Christianity is all about. That's why, brethren, when you think about knowledge, how do you acquire knowledge? It's either something you learn by reading or it's something you learn by doing. And if Christianity is a taught religion and it's a knowledge-based religion, then guess what we need to be busy about when we come together as Christians? Teaching and encouraging and increasing our knowledge and our remembrance, if you will. Knowledge comes from the Greek word gnosis, which simply means your understanding, to come to know something. Proverbs 3 at verse 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not upon thine own understanding. And then tells us 
what true understanding is. Chapter 1, verse 7, Proverbs says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. So you want to look at a country, at a society that has knowledge, then you look at a country or a society that has a fear of God. You want to look at a society that has a lot of high-tech gadgets and gadgets and internet and outer net and every kind of net you can think of and all the little bells and whistles. But what is true knowledge? True knowledge is a base fear of God, respect, a respect for godly things and wanting to live godly lives. That is true knowledge, and that's basically the virtue, knowledge, not just knowledge, good book knowledge, but that fear of God, to come to have a respect of God's word. Brethren, one of the things that, reasons I do what I do, and one of the reasons that I might not be the most popular preacher in the whole world is the fact that I, I fear God first and foremost. I know that I have to answer for God for everything I've ever said from a pulpit. I understand that that's a weighty thing and that there's a lot riding on that. And while I'd like for you to like me and I'd love for you to love me, I do like you and I do love you. But the word of God must be preached and it must be taught in its simplicity. And sometimes the things that must be said are not the most easily said or heard thing. Sometimes they're, they almost sound unloving. They almost like sound like, well, you're just trying to pick a fighter. Or you don't really care about people. When in reality, the opposite is the truth. The opposite is deed. It's fact. If you love somebody, you're going to tell them what they need to hear. And sometimes that's not very easy. And sometimes that comes with a price. Sometimes that's the, that price is the very friendship and the very love that you have. The next one, of course, is temperance. Temperance comes from this really crazy, hard-to-say word, which means self-control. And it's, it's not a self-control from, from cowardice or, or weakness or just inability to act, but means of strength, where you're taking your strength and you're calming yourself to where you're holding yourself back. You're using self-restraint. It's when you want to say something and you know you shouldn't. It's when you want to do something. And maybe life would just tell you to reach out and grab a hold of somebody and try to rub a little sense into their head. You use self-restraint. You use temperance. You use self-control. And that's exactly what's being spoke, spoken of here. You have the strength to do something else, but you're holding yourself back. You're restraining yourself so that the cause of Christ and so that the good news may be effective. Next we run across is patience. Patience is, is from a very, very, man, you're talking about a common word, hupomone. It's all over the place. It simply means to stay under. It means to get up in the mornings and go to work and stay under. It means to be a daddy and stay under. It means to be a husband and stay under. You want to know why our country is in a lot of the mess it is? Because we don't know how to hupomone, that's for sure. We don't have patience. We don't have patience in our marriages. We don't have patience with our kids. We don't have patience with our jobs. We don't have patience with nothing. We wanted it yesterday, and if we don't like the things the way things are going, we just quit and go somewhere else and start doing something else. And it's killing this country. It's killing our society. It's killing our homes. I look at some of those children on, you know, the, the news is all the time showing how kids are, you know, coming from broken homes, and they don't have... Uh, this, they don't have that, and that's why we're having all these gang problems and things of this nature. They just want to fit in. And I think about how many daddies have quit on mommy. I think about how many mommies have quit on daddy. And I think about how many of us as a group, as a whole, as a nation, have just give up on the family. We just give up on what's right, and we just get along to get along. And it's high time we change that. If we don't start changing some things, things are not going to get better. And start, not that we don't love people, and we realize people make mistakes. And we're not condemning people forever, but we're saying, listen, this is the right way. Do it this way, and let us help you do it this way. And encourage people to do what's right, instead of condoning and encouraging that which is wrong. Under to stay. A cheerful, hopeful endurance, patience. To love your wife, to love your children, to go to work, to do a job, to be that common man. I know I've told you this before, but, you know, it made a big impact on me listening to, to Barry Grouter talking about one of his uncles. I can't remember which one of Harold's brothers it was that had passed. Talk about how he was a common fella. Well, you know, 30, 40 years ago, maybe that was more common. But nowadays, it's getting real hard to find common fellas. 
that stay with mama, that stay with their families, that stay with their jobs and go out and do things that they might not like to do, but they do it because they got a love of God, they got a love of family, they got a love of country, and they want to try to leave a good example for their family, for their friends, to be something in the community. And it seems like we've lost a huge part of that. We need patience. And as a Christian virtue, that has to be a part of it. We have to have patience. But not only patience, we call this godliness. Godliness simply means that a, a holiness, a loving what God loves and hating what God hates. You know, there's things that God hates. And we, too, are to hate the things that God hates. And that means we don't hate sinners, but we hate the sin. And we tell people what sin is. And we try to encourage them not to live in sin. Brotherly kindness. Boy, this is exactly how you spell that if you take the Greek letters and bring them right over into English. Philadelphia. Fraternal affection. And, brethren, that is a Christian virtue. And if you do not have a fraternal affection for me, then you're not practicing me. And I use me because I'm probably the extreme. I'm probably the hardest. But fraternal affection is everybody in this room. A brotherly, fraternal affection. To love the brother across the aisle from you as your brother. To love your sister across the aisle from you as your sister. To love those in this room tonight because they are a part of the body of Christ. A fraternal affection. Yes, I realize this could be talking about all of humanity as well, but not in the sense that Peter's using it about. This is a Christian grace. And in order to have this Christian grace, guess what one must first be? A Christian. This is talking about the people in this room, specifically this passage, this context, is talking about how we feel about one another and the affection that with a special place in your heart that you should have for a child of God. Hey, we're walking the same walk. We're living the same life. We're trying to live by the same rule book. And you know as well as I do, that is not easy. Some of us may need more help than others. Some of us need the patience of our brethren more than others. Some of us need the encouragement more than others. Brethren, one of the things I've tried to do in all the years that I've preached is to figure out those people who need to be stroked a little bit more than those who don't. There's some people who need more attention than other people. There's some people who don't want attention. And so I realize that, and I try to give them as much freedom as I can. I'm always available, but I don't want to make myself a, a burden to anybody. But I try to find those people that I realize need to be uh, talked to more, that need encouragement. And then there's those sometimes that need that and don't. And we as a congregation need to do that. Now, I, I love every one of you now, and I guess what I'm going to get on to you about a little bit, and maybe not even get on to you, but, but say is something I want you to think real seriously about. If once the final bell blows or the final amen or whatever that we do here and there's 70 or 80 of us or 100 on Sunday morning and we run off real quick to our special little three or four people that are all the way together, that's going to cut you out of talking to about 96 other people on Sunday morning. That's going to keep you from talking to other 66 people on Sunday night that you could. Now listen to me. I'm not saying you can't have special friends. I'm totally aware of what the Bible talks about. Jesus had 12 that he ran around with, and of that 12, he had three that really ran around with him. He'd go to places he didn't want all of them to go. He'd take Peter, James, and John. And then there was one that of those three that was even more particularly, and John would refer to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved, that he had a real close relationship with. I'm not condemning that at all. There's some of you here that I know that I have a lot in common with, more so than others. And so a lot of times we'll spend more time talking than other people. But initially, I try to get around, and I encourage you, try to say hello and goodbye and all those other things to as many people as you can initially. And trust me, you'll only have about five minutes. Can Brethren can disperse quick. Man, we're like a oil and water. We can get gone, can't we? We can disperse quick. So you don't have, to, you don't have a big window. So spend about that first five or six minutes and try to spend as much time with maybe somebody that you haven't seen before or don't know their name or haven't got to know as well as you have others. And then use that other 25 minutes, some of us hang around half an hour afterwards to get to know and talk to those family members and people, your good friends, a little bit more. And that way, that'll help us develop this fraternal affection because it's hard to be fraternally affected to somebody you don't even know. 
that you have very little in common with, and you might have a lot more in common with it than you know, but you just don't get a chance to spend the time. That's why I love the ladies' days. I love the youth devotionals any time. We can get an excuse to come together and spend a little time together. It's a good thing, and it'll help us develop this brotherly kindness, this fraternal affection. And then the last thing, I mean, it's the capstone. It is the wheel, the cog that moves everything, and it's love, and it's real. This is not just, oh, I have a great concern for all my brothers. No, it's, it's a real love. It's legitimate love. Hey, I care about him. He's my brother. He means something to me. That's my sister, and that's their kids. And I, I'm part of, responsible for them children. One day I hope to have them in Bible class. We love each other. And it's a thing that moves on. Jesus says this is going to be so strong that people are going to see you, and they're going to know you're my disciple because of this badge called love. It's also a love that says, listen now, you've been missing a little bit here lately. and We sure have been missing. We want to see more of you. It's a love of concern. Not only is it a fraternal love, but it's also a love that bonds and holds each other up to a particular standard and encourages us each other to be what we ought to be. The same thing you would do with a brother or sister in your family who's not doing what they ought to be doing. You try to encourage them to do what's right. So there is our seven Christian graces and I'm sure that Brother uh, Keeble would have done a much better job had he been here than I. But the five steps into the, into the kingdom or into the church and seven steps into heaven. This last word, love, the capstone, Greek word agape, uh, charity, I'm sure probably fit that real well uh, 400 years ago. But I just like to use the word love now. We, I think, have a better grasp of that. This goes on after these graces. After these graces are enumerated, Peter says, For if these things be in you, these seven graces that we've talked about, and abound, notice they increase, they get stronger, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind. We get our word nearsighted from this very word here. He's blind and cannot see afar off. And have forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. I think sometimes, brethren, that's what happens to us as we walk our Christian walk. Sometimes we forget the sins that we had, the great sacrifice that was made for us. And we're not as thankful that we would be if we remembered that. And that's exactly what Peter says, that we become kind of nearsighted. Start thinking about ourselves more than we think about other folks. And in verse 10 is where we'll stop tonight. Wherefore the rather, brethren, I just love that saying, wherefore the rather, brethren, that don't even make good sense, does it? But I've always loved that verse. Wherefore the rather, because of this, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. In other words, spend some time with these things we've talked about. Try to increase your knowledge, your brotherly love, your kindness, your temperance, your virtue. But give diligence to these things to make your college and election sure. For if you do these things, Ye shall never fall. You want to have one saved, always saved? This is it right here. One saved, always saved. Obey the gospel, and then you spend the rest of your life increasing in these graces. You'll bear the fruits of the Spirit, as enumerated in Galatians chapter 5, and upon your deathbed. The preacher won't have to make up some story. He'll be able to just preach your life, and you'll be what you want to be. You'll be lived faithful unto God. If you're here tonight, not a New Testament Christian, let me encourage you, don't leave this room without being one. If we can help you in any way, would you come as together we stand and sing? Well, I'll be away, dear brother.